preserves the trust responsibility and make sure that there is a uh, the obligation to the United States continue, but that the functions of the day-to-day -day management, in part, are carried out by the Osage Nation. In this case, through the Minerals Council, and maybe some elements of the Osage Nation government that aren't the Minerals Council. So, um, this is the opportunity that has presented itself through changes in the law. And the question is, it's always been, in the, in certainly you see it in the Hearth Act, where now if there's a lease of trust land or some sort of action related to surface land, Osage Nation lands, that that is now carried out by the Osage Nation without an approval each time. Well, why does that matter? It's a matter that the tribe would exercise more self-governance, more authority over its lands. I think that matters in and of itself as a principle. But what is about this that is, makes this more advantageous? What is a terror? What promise does it have? Well, one of the main things is that the environmental statute, the primary one, the National Environmental Protection Act, NEPA, creates a lot of work, creates a lot of requirements on the Secretary of the Interior. Each time there's an action that triggers NEPA, requires action on NEPA to take place. So what Otero would do, and it was really created for this purpose, was to avoid having to comply with NEPA at every turn. So there are things that the Minerals Council could do when it comes to approving a lease, which they already do a lot of work on these approvals now, that they carry it out themselves without triggering these federal requirements. So the Minerals Council has moved deliberately, I've served as legal counsel on, on this matter, and it's been you know, a long process of looking into this as a possibility. A long process of saying, what does the law say? What is the Department of the Interior saying about this possibility? And we have an unusual situation here, as many of you know. If you look to what other tribes do in this area, it's only it's helpful, but not that much, right? It matters what Southern Ute does. It matters what the three affiliated tribes, Mandan, and Dogs of the River. But here we've got the 1906 Osage Allotment Act. It's an unusual legal situation that's been in place for over a century. There's been some changes over the years. But that law has created a situation where the land we stand on right now, the entire Osage Mineral Reservation subsurface is held in trust for the Osage tribe. Then funds that are derived from the Osage Mineral Estate are paid into the United States into federal accounts on behalf of the tribe. Those monies are invested for a quarter, up to a quarter and then paid out to payroll holders. So that, those fundamental elements of that Osage trust system have been in place now for over a century. Our fathers and grandmothers, grandfathers, aunts and uncles have been in leadership, they protected that system. So it was only supposed to last 25 years. So in 1906, when this law was enacted, I like to call it an expiration statute. It was meant to terminate at the end of 25 years where the system would no longer take place. There would no longer be a relationship between the United States and the Osage tribe. And the, whoever owned the surface of the land would own the subsurface. And then you'd have to go to them for uh, minerals production. Well, that got extended, and that got extended again by the Congress. So, that system has been protected by the Osage tribe, the Osage nation, over the years. And that system continues to be protected under law, under this terror. Now, again, no decisions have been made on whether to do this or not. But right now, I can tell you the Minerals Council members has said repeatedly the status quo is unacceptable. The situation with production of minerals on this reservation is unacceptable. 
Now, I can remember coming to tribal council meetings with my dad when he was a local food tribe. And uh, Minerals Council, the tribal council at that time, you know, they're part of their job, as far as I could tell when I was a kid, they got after the superintendent. All right? They got after the superintendent and said, why aren't you doing this right? Why aren't you doing that right? Why don't you do this? But the superintendent ran things. Anybody know who runs things on a day-to-day -day basis now when it comes to Osage Minerals? The superintendent. So after the, uh, after the Minerals Council signs a lease, who manages that lease? Anybody know? Superintendent, Bureau of Indian Affairs. Who does all the checks when it comes to Endangered Species Act? Superintendent working with another federal agency. All right. Who does the environmental reviews? Requires that. It's a little bit more complicated, but there's NEPA compliance. A lot of things that happen. It's done by the Bureau of Indian Affairs, the Osage Agency. Now that agency has been terribly mismanaged. That's my, that's my opinion on that. Of course, the Office of Inspector General agrees with me. And anybody know how many uh, positions are filled in the Osage Agency? How, many, uh, how much understaffing there is now? Minerals Council members? They're terribly understaffed. They can't find people to fill the positions. And what can the Minerals Council do about that? Get after the superintendent. Get after them. That's what you do, right? It's a federal responsibility. All the hiring, and how much someone's paid, and that job description. It just becomes a question of what they, they decide to do. Now, what happens if the Minerals Council doesn't like those decisions, or those positions are not filled, and the work is not done? Almost nothing, right? You can get after them some more. You can get after them some more. So the question with regard to a tariff is whether or not those positions could be better uh, those functions of the Bureau of Indian Affairs, some of them, could be better managed by the Osage Minerals Council or parts of the Osage Nation government. Now, I think we all need to acknowledge this would be a big step, a different step. Self-governance among the Osages is still pretty, pretty new. But when it comes to running our own businesses, I've heard people say, we don't know how to run it. Of course, the casino, right, brings in tens of millions to the government each year. Remember, we didn't have a tax commission. It wasn't that long ago, was it? it? Wasn't that long ago we didn't collect our own taxes. If you remember, not so long ago we didn't run our own clinic. And I can remember the kind of thinking was that we're Osages, we don't have to do any of those things. That's what other tribes have to do to try to get by. But now Osage government has grown so substantially, but we've also provided more service, they provide uh, more revenues. Now the question is minerals, what do we do about the situation that we're in today? Do we continue to do what we're doing? And maybe that's the right answer, I don't know. But do we continue to let the superintendent run Osage minerals? Now, some would say, don't mess with the Bureau of Indian Affairs. I had one person tell me after one of these meetings, without the BIA, we are not Osages. So without that superintendent, we cease to be Osage. Now, shake your head, but now, come on now. If you're a believer in some of these things, where, where does that come from? As some of our relatives, they're filming movies around here about an era of time. There were people that were expecting this uh, trouble sage trust to end. So we are looking at a time, we're looking at a set of laws 
that presume what? The 1906 Act. Enormous protections of our minerals, right? Unusual, we are a unique system of government where but the United States Congress created more direct involvement in the day-to-day -day lives of Osage government and Osage people than any tribe in America. Imagine, you know, it used to be that people act like it's not a real thing when people talk about the incompetence of Osage. What that meant. Now that's changed over time for the better. But that is the presumption of some of these laws, is that the reason we have the Bureau of Indian Affairs is because the Osage just can't do it ourselves. We don't have the capacity, we just can't hire people, can't do a better job than the BIA. So the Terra has things about it that are have to may or may not be good. We can't take over the whole thing. We can take over certain parts of it. The Bureau of Indian Department of the Interior says there's certain inherent federal functions you can't have. That stay with us. Other parts of it, yes. We have to let you manage those yourselves if we enter into a terror. And then you will need to hire your own people. You will need, we'll give you federal funds, but we'll see if it's enough or not. And that management on a day-to-day -day basis for at least part of those functions would be handled by the Osage Minerals Council or say the Osage Nation uh, Environmental Department, Environment and Natural Resources. So that's the hard question we're facing today. If you think there's easy answers to that, I, you know, I respectfully disagree with you. There are hard decisions to make about production of oil and gas, another mineral. I can tell you, the Minerals Council say over and over how they hear from elderly Osages about the difficulty of trying to get by when the minerals and production is down so low, as it is right now. They're the ones that get to hear about that on a day-to-day -day basis. Why is it that these, my checks are so far down? Why is it that we are in the situation that we're in? Particularly when oil prices are not so bad. Why are people not coming here to invest in Osage oil, Osage gas like they once used to? Some might say, oh, the Minerals Council doesn't isn't trying to attract them the right way, you know, or something like that. I can tell you the oil and gas industry, in my experience, that is not how they think about things. They're an industry that's trying to make money. They're a high risk taking industry. They need information to be able to make a decision on whether to uh, invest in a certain place or to drill in a certain place. So right now, if someone comes to the Osage agency and says, I'm a company and should do a business here. I need well records for a certain area. And so I can make a, a rational judgment about whether to lease and to drill on those lands. It used to be that a person could walk in and they could go to the agency and they could access those records. And they could look at them there and they could make copies or have somebody make copies for them. And they could walk in and they could look and decide, okay, I'm either going to lease here or not, or make a judgment about whether there's business opportunity here or not. The Osage Agency has made a decision that accessing those records now has to be done through a Freedom of Information Act request, meaning we have to take the time for lawyers to go through each document and read back information that was accessible to the public sometimes for over a century. So it may be several months before you get your information. Maybe several months before you get that information that you need to look. So most of those companies have decided we're not, it's not worth it to us. Right now, um, entering into a lease or you know, taking other actions where you want to do business here, the Bureau of Indian Affairs decided we're going to make it harder. 
So the question is, on the terror, what do we do? Well, how do we see those? What are our tools to try to change things for the better? One answer is, we don't have the capacity to do it. The Bureau of Indian Affairs can do this better than we can, even if they do a terrible job. They may do a terrible job, but it's better than we do. So let's just get after them. Let's stay getting after the superintendent. That's our best option. That's happened. I, that continues to happen in the Amendment Minerals Council meetings. And a superintendent can take notes and decide whether she's going to do anything about that or not. And if she doesn't or gets back to you in months, you don't have any tools to deal with that, right? So uh, that's the situation we're dealing with. Uh, how do we make sure that the Osage Trust that was created in 1906, that trust responsibility we have with the United States is preserved? Well, the new tier law makes clear on the face that that is not diminished. Right? How do we find some way to more production that leads to more money for head rack holders, because that's what I've heard the Minerals Council say over and over again. This does not make sense unless it means more money for head rack holders. So, uh, how do we do this when someone says, I want to come into the Osage Reservation, and it's going to take me uh, 90 days to get a drilling permit, or I don't get one at all because the American Hearing Beetle. Right. Then how do we find some way to cut down that time when somebody actually wants to come do business with us? That they, they can actually get a permit to drill in a more efficient period of time. Is there some way that if we do that ourselves to the terror, that we can make that more process that process more efficient? Thinks those are some of the questions that are being asked. So um, that's where we are. That's where the Minerals Council has been on this. That's what I've been tasked out to look into. And there's a lot here. I'm not going to tell you that a Terra is a simple thing. But you know, we as Wajaja people, part of our barrier is the idea that we are not we are not better than your Indian Affairs. That's part of our barrier, is our own minds about some of these things. We, we can't do it better than BIA. There's some kind of magic curtain behind all that, where there's brilliant people in that superintendent's office that know all about oil and gas so much, they know so much about it, that if we try to do what they do, we're going to blow the whole thing up. They're too brilliant over there for us. So, is that what said, right? Though? Am I kidding about that? How is it that the BIA is so good that they've got so many people over in Mahuska that are, know all about this, so, so much expertise that it's unattainable for us? I have yet to find an answer to that question that says that that's not something that we that's true. I've heard it. I've heard it over and over. We mess with that. There's, you know, we're going to mess it up. And you know what? There's a lot of evidence. Somebody can say, "What about the Osage LLC? Mess that up." Right? Oh yeah. There's evidence that we make the Osage Nation government makes mistakes. So, but what is that? that? That's the things we're dealing with is our own mind on some of these things. What are the barriers? But that's the central part of it, is our own way of thinking about our relationship with the United States as well as people. Now, do we want to keep the United States on the hook? And this trust responsibility, you better believe we do. You better believe we do. We sued the United States a number of years ago. Some of the people here in this room were involved in that lawsuit directly. 
We learned a lot of things about how the Osage Agency operates, both good and bad. One of the things I've learned is there's people who work in the Osage Agency that they got the best intentions, but they're understaffed, they're under-resourced. You know, they can't, don't have enough to do the job they're supposed to do. But doesn't mean they're not well-intentioned. Many of them are Osage. But at the same time, these structures around federal law and federal rules, some of them just create problems for the Osages in trying to, if you've got a singular goal of creating more revenues that are paid out to head right holders, there are, there are barriers there that shouldn't be there. Does that mean we do everything for the well companies? Give them whatever they want? No, of course not. But there are business partners, right? There are business partners. So we have to create an environment here where people want to come and do business with us. Now that business right now ends at the Bureau of Indian Affairs because they ultimately decide what's going to happen. We can sign the lease. At this point, there's not that many people want to lease out this vast reservation land. It still has, you know, according to federal estimates, billions of barrels of oil left. So the Minerals Council is trying to work through that and find answers to that. What should we, if anything, take over ourselves to try to create efficiencies in the process of leasing and managing the Osage Mineral Estate? Right now, that management, we lease. Minerals Council, they enter into leases, they negotiate leases. And I hear a lot of people talk about uh, the, the Minerals Council and their management of the mineral estate. Does anybody believe the Minerals Council manages the Osage Mineral Estate? They don't. The Bureau of Indian Affairs does. We can't take it over if we, some of that, we can't take it over if we want to. For example, the government said, when it comes to uh, uh, collecting money and investing and paying it out, that's something that's inherent federal function. The Minerals Council said, that's good. We don't want to do that. Right? But there's other parts of it that they think is worth taking a look at. And they, it matters to them that they, you know, they hear from Osage head records about it. The Osage Nation government has a constitutional obligation to do that. And so the intent of the Minerals Council here is to be transparent about that. How do we hear from you about that? I know it matters what you think. What head right holders think, trust me, it matters to them. They hear from them pretty regularly. I know, because I hear back from them about, boy, they're, you know, some people are happy with this, or not happy with that. We don't understand this, don't understand that. So uh, those are some of the just, some of the questions that have to be, the Minerals Council is trying to answer best they can. And some of that also is a, there's an Osage Nation element to this because it's a government-to-government -government agreement that is not exclusively Osage Minerals Council to do. Right? So if you hate the Osage Nation as government, you think it should have never been created, you're not going to like a tariff because they're going to have to be involved. Right? That's one of those things. If you think the Osage, there never should have been a change of government, you know, that's... Trying to find some way to overturn that, and you're not going to like it here. Right? But um, if you think that there's a, the Minerals Council's already said we're exploring how do we do this better, is there some way we can make minerals production on the Osage Reservation more efficient, do so in a way where we exercise authority or sovereignty or uh, possibilities of self governance? some delegated authority, some sovereign, in some way that can put this all together where somebody says, wait a second, I want to lease land there, I want to you know, find ways to produce oil and gas there other minerals. But that's where, that's what they want to hear from you again. So I think there's going to be a presentation about some of the details of it. So you have more information about what this is and what the Minerals Council has been thinking about it. For you to comment on, 
what it is and what it's not. I'll be back up if that's my part of the presentation, but it is a long time. And, but uh, that's the purpose of this meeting, so I'll turn it over to Jim Trump. Question? Yes. You're presenting a PowerPoint. Do we have any printed material? I came in a little late. Do we have anything written? He was at the door. He was at the door. Is that the door? Yes, sir. Front door? All right, well, we're going to go ahead and get started. So, probably about a year ago, we started with. You know, where are we going to go with this? Uh, looking at, we did a first a pre application. And that was the first thing we said that we would do. This is what we're showing you is an informational of what's been done today. So let's go to the first one. Can you see? All right. So the first thing we did is what, what impact will happen. So on a market analysis, we know that we're going to be doing a tariff, and we already know that the BIA is underfunded, like Wilson had explained, and the positions are not filled. One of the things we need to do is that we have engaged the Osage Nation HR in assisting with position descriptions and salary analysis. That was one of the first things we did. The good thing is we had some lessons learned because they have already uh, compacted uh, the Wajaji Health Clinic and also the Realty. So we knew that we needed to have the information before us. We asked the Bureau of Indian Affairs for this and it took them, what, to some of the team members, four months before we even got any information back for them. So we went ahead and were more progressive and just said, hey, we'll go work with our HR. The other one is on technical analysis. The Terra Task Force evaluated statutory regulatory requirements to satisfy the federal government oil and gas standards with specific focus on the well data. So that's one of the other impacts that we'll have. And then the financial analysis is under the Terra, the OMC will be able to streamline the permit approval process work with the oil and gas producers, and will forecast future revenues. So, I'm gonna step over here. One of the things that, in order to do this economic analysis, to do all these terror impacts, number one, we had to look at this. We had to go, what do we need to do within this framework? And that is our constitution. The other document, that we're also familiar with, those who work within the Osage Nation government, is Title 25, Chapter 1, Bureau of Indian Affairs, Part 226. This is everything that we need to know about when we do uh, how to work with the Bureau and also what the oil producers have to do with. And us. Like it says in here, we're supposed to have four lease sales a year. That's their responsibility. Just so you all know, we have now moved in and we passed a resolution. We are now going to be having four lease sales in here. That's the responsibility to us. So here's another document that we looked at as we go through. This is the Osage Headright history from 1880, and these are the actual prices. The reason we want to do a tariff or look at a tariff and explain why we should or if this isn't for us, then we'll just keep status quo. But if you look at these prices, we're going down. We know that our third quarter was $1,360. That's horrible. And we've heard from all of you. We've heard how much it's hurt your livelihood. Some people say, this is what I retired on. 
And our job as Minerals Council is to look at how we can increase it. If we maintain what we're doing right now, it won't happen. So we've got to be looking at, looking at different ways how we can do it. And then we have this program that gives us the ability. Before you can ever get into business, you got to have a regulation. Regulatory, and then you can get into business. So the other one, so we did an economic analysis. The enhanced permit approval process will increase mineral production and future lease sale revenues for the benefit of the Osage shareholders, including improving transparency of oil and gas production. We will now get that information. Environmental analysis. The federal trigger is removed. Current EIS serves as the basis for all permitting processes. So last fall, I don't know when the exact date was, Wilson. Oh, October 2020. This EIS was finally passed. So we don't have to wait and wonder about, you know, what that environmental impact. We've got one of the tools done. So what does that do? We just, Wilson was just talking to us about the federal trigger is removed. Right now, if someone wants to go and get a permit today, 270 days to get a, to get a permit. 270 days. You can go one county over and say, this is what I, I want this, this track of land, and this is what I want to develop. And what happens? You can be out there pulling your rig in 14 days. Come over here to Osage, 270. Our last biannual meeting, they said, hey, we've reduced that time down to 220, some, some leases to 200 days. Would you like to wait to get your paycheck and 270 days for work that we want to do right now? Absolutely not. It's just insane. So anyway, we can go to the next one. So I'm going to turn it over to, to Mr. Tremblay. Dr. Tremblay has been assisting us on this workflow. This is what he does in his professional career, and uh, we're very glad to have him on. As, you know, um, as a tribal member, he came back and has offered us his services. And so, uh, underneath, uh, we put him team in with uh, Pipe Stem Law, and um, he'll go over what the Terra workflow looks like and how we got there. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> So last June, toward the end of June, uh, the Mineral Council came to and said, you know, we want to investigate Terra. And so uh, I offered to help navigate the process of doing a project. I am a certified project manager, and that's what this is, is a project. So, so last September we started, and we started building the scope and looking at the scope of project management and how big this was going to be. And we started putting the team together and we formed a task force. All of the Mineral Council was invited to participate in the task force. Uh, some were more active than others, and, and that's fine. In addition to that, we had uh, Katie Thomas from the Office of the Chief. We had several Congress. Uh, Congress people that were there, uh, myself, Paul Gates, and Wilson Pipestone were all, that's what comprised the task force. So the task force, we started working in two different directions. We started working towards an organization chart and the legal work, which obviously was, uh, fell into the, the bandwidth of, of Pipestone law. But we took, we took all of the BIA functions and we looked at the inherent federal functions that were excluded that we couldn't touch. And, and to be honest, many of those we, don't, we didn't want to touch, like Wilson said. Uh, but there were some that we did, and, and they were contractable functions that we could take over. So we looked at those, we looked at what the BIA, how they did them, and we started coming up with the organization chart, which is the basis for all of our cost estimates. 
because by far the largest single cost in an organization is going to be labor costs, right? So we developed a preliminary organization chart, then we started looking at costing exercises to determine how much revenue was going to need, need to be generated. And, and again, I want to iterate, the, the revenue is not in any way, shape, or form coming from any shareholder. Or any of the funds, or the profits, or revenue that is due to shareholder. Um, and, and we're going to talk about that a little bit in a minute. But we did revenue, de gener revenue determination, and so now we're at this point right here. This is a go, no go decision. And that's what the Mineral Council is soliciting input from all of you. Do you want to go forward or do you want to not? And if you decide not to, then the Mineral Council will go to the end. If they decide to go forward, we'll finalize the application and then we'll submit it to the Department of Interior. That doesn't mean that it's done. It doesn't mean we're, we're block locked in. Uh, the night before the Department of Interior signs it says, uh, you know, okay, we accept the tariff, we enter into an agreement, we can back out. Even after it's done, there are off ramps where we can step back and back out if we need to. So I, I want everybody to understand that there's a safety net that's in there, you know, that. that it's not tying our hands as to what we do. Thank you, Gordon. How many days left? They have 270 days once we submit it to, to accept it or deny it. Obviously, if we go if we go to the point of finalizing it, submitting it, negotiating it, and coming up with an agreement, we're not. I mean, I can't. I can't see us back now in the last minute. What is that? Why is that? Why don't we do that? I'll give you some examples of why we would do that. What happens if we submit something and the Bureau of Indian Affairs Department here comes back and says we disagree with this part of that part, and some part we're not going to give you enough funding to do it. It made a lot of sense for the Mendels Council and the nation to say, we don't want to do it with that. No, yeah, we don't want to do it. This tariff has been going on for 10 years now, and you're still pushing for it. And if you want to turn it over partly and be run by the nation, I hear they're not doing too well in the second we got into the Whitley Department, the Indian Health Care, and done staff. You want to hand that over to them? I'm going to introduce that to us. I'll the same with the U.S. government. Um, How many treaties? Um, How many treaties has the other side just had with the U.S. government? Uh, let me ask you this. Better hey, how many of you have Hey, the high cost of price case, okay. it has not been adhered to. They haven't done anything that they were supposed to do. They need to be sued, is what they need to do. Let me ask you this. Aren't you making an argument of why they should take it over then? If the Bureau of Indian no, Affairs is doing what they're no, supposed to be doing, we don't want to lose our trust. We don't want to lose our trust. By law, we, they can't be taken away. By law, we can't. You can't with the tariff. That's right. You can't. No, you can't. I mean, the law is very, very specific. And I'm not a lawyer, so I'll refer right. to Mr. Pipestone. But the, my understanding is the law is very specific that the trust relationship between the Osage and the U.S. government is not impacted in any way, shape, or form on tariff. Yes, ma'am. You, you mentioned that once we start this, there is a time frame where if we are not happy with it, we can turn it back. What is that time frame? Once we start, once we start down the road. Yeah, if you start down the road and you decide that the Osage Nation is not happy. The situation. What is the point of turning it back to the Bureau? 
you can do that. So that's uh, that certainly happens. Say you say that there was a tariff, it was entered into it, it was accepted. That can be turned back over to the United States by law. By now, what the time frame is is depends on how quickly what functions it is. Now we have already stepped in back in house when we get that. Well, the law said it provides a specific process for doing it. Yeah, that's but it's it's let, let me let me say right up front. I'm an everyone sit at this table that gives tariffs so on mine. Yay! Okay, no, 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 no. I'm not my I'm not having to say the oh, oh. Oh. <laughs> So let me tell you, because this is not going the direction I think the council had wanted it to go. And so I said, let me get up and talk to these folks. Now, I'm not trying to discount you guys over here, but this came was really loud over here about being in disagreement, okay? So, let me say this. I have been opposed to terror. I am the only council member who does not sit on the couch. I have argued till I am blue in the face with Wilson. I have argued with Margo. Tommy and I have been at all, and we walk away to shake hands and say it's okay to disagree. Mm -hmm. So, I'm not in favor of terror. But probably not for the same reason that you think. We're not going to lose our trust. The, the BIA is always going to have trust responsibility to us. Yeah, I hope so. Okay. But let, let me finish, okay? So I also, I also agree with those of you who say, I'm not sure I want to hand this to the nation. Because this was a four year term for me, but I'm a shareholder for life. And I'm not happy to got here, right? So I'm not sure I want to hand it over to the nation. However, what I am asking of you tonight is the same thing I'm doing. I'm sitting right back over here. This is not my dog and pony show. I'm trying to learn just like you are. I don't go to these terror task force meetings. I get the report that comes out. The same report you can log into and get online. That's what I know about it. But I want to tell you something. Today we got an email from the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Well, we got it from Wilson. Uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs. After the council, they terminated how many leases? Of white grass? 19 leases. And we, as a council, said, don't terminate. We want these leases to go another year. And they came back to the superintendent and the regional director. Superintendent said no. We appealed to the regional director. He said no. You're all high. We are, but that's that's money that we're now we are using shareholder money yes. to litigate. So when you folks are out here saying, why are you spending all this money on legal fees? Because we're being shut down everywhere we go with the superintendent and the BIA. So understand that, what we're facing here. Again, I'm not trying to sell you on the tariff. Because I'm not necessarily for it. But I did want to hear what they have to say. And I'll tell you something that makes a difference to me. And I've, I've been real open with Tali about this. He's, he's been pro-tariff, and I've been anti-tariff. And I said, what I would be willing to do is take over portions and give it a try. I don't want to jump in full belt. And I may be the only council member who votes no, and I'm okay with that. I understand, though, the nation says we want to do all or nothing. That's what we've been told. So what I'm asking you as shareholders, if you think that we only need to do certain portions, if there's something you think we can do better than the Bureau, then tell us. And we can take that back to the nation and say, listen, our constituents say they want us to do this, but none of this. Give us something to work with. Because, you know, when I was put in that position, it was to be your voice. Not mine. I'm a lawyer, and I'm looking at everything skeptical. Right? I'm looking at this meeting going, this is getting us nowhere. So listen to what they have to say, ask your questions, and then give us feedback of whether you think there's any portion of it that is viable. We need uh, information on care exactly what it contains. Have you read it all? Ma'am, I am not a member of the task force. No, I'm here with the other. I think that. I think that this is our opportunity, my name, to say, yes, we want to take over uh, approving leases. No, we don't want to take over the finances. 
Yes, we want to do. Yes, we want to do this. No, we don't want to do that. And he's pro tariff. He's in that middle. He's not pro tariff. Uh, meetings. Wilson Blackstone works for the council. I've been a lawyer a long time. And I know he's pro tariff. I don't think he is pro tariff. I think he is. I've had a lot of personal one on one conversations with him. I don't think I think he's doing what he wants to do. Uh, I think that. So what I'm saying is just listen and see if there's any of it that you're interested. If you at the end of this meeting say, we don't want we don't want any of it, then that a council takes away. Well, over and over this meeting, we said we don't want it. Well, you we haven't been over this but the law has changed. This is what I'm gonna see. You understand? I do. This may work out the bones of four thousand and some people. It's not the same thing the decision. It, a little more, but yes, and, and I agree, there are components that we need to know what are. I don't know those components either, but we're going to ask questions. I'm just saying, let's, let's see if there's any questions. Uh, Nancy? Um, you mentioned that you appeal to the regions or whatever, mm -hmm. and, and someone said, hey, you've heard of Yeah, but IBIA is your last choice. But my question is, who, who really is going to challenge this? And let me be specific. It was my understanding that there was an attorney that went to the Fletcher case and intervened and said the shareholders have no standing. Yes. So, if the general counsel has no standing, who's going to fight our fight for us? Is it going to be the nation then? You're talking about two different things when you're talking about Fletcher case and what, we're, what our responsibility to the mayor is. So, okay. Let me, let me, okay. Okay. Let me shift here. So okay. okay. Um, you mentioned, I heard you were transparency here this evening. Yeah. Uh, so what are the issues with the BIA that you want to take over? Well, you know, those, those, are the those, those are the questions I have. Yeah. I don't know. Let me say this. If you do a book with the Secretary of the Interior, your mom at the time of the week, she has destroyed the minerals trust. Then what happens? Do they're not in the nation? Well, that, that will never happen because Congress is going to override any tribal law, right? Federal law always trumps on tribal law. Um, so we have a Congressional Act in 1906 that, that, that guides us. So that's never going to happen. We're never going to eliminate the Secretary of the Interior. And those are not my reasons for being opposed to terror. Some of my reasons for being opposed to terror is I don't think that we ought to... I'll, I'll just be real straightforward with you. There's people at home. We're not always going to have a shareholder who's chief. And I have argued that point. So what do we do when we have a shareholder who's chief? We want to make sure that shareholders' voices are as loud as they are now. Okay? And not, uh, not superseded by a non-shareholder chief. Again, all I'm saying is just listen to what they say, then let's ask these questions. Because I have the same questions you do. And, and right now tonight, I come in with the same no vote that you have. But I want, I want to hear what they have to say. I want them to answer my questions. Because I've been looking at that. Well, I, yeah, I don't know if you heard this one, but. I mean, it's all the same thing. This is a brand new law that's the chair that the OSA is still looking at. So, uh, the chair was presented to us in the beginning of our new government year 2000. Yeah, a long time. And it took us about two days to look over and say, hey, we don't want this. And nobody did. Yeah. Nobody yeah. ever signed nobody up. Nobody signed up. But now that they have reconfigured the CFR and trying to make it more appealing to be here or to take over, then how many times have taken over this and have applied for this to the care of God? Okay, so nobody has applied for it, though. So no, you're the first to look at it. But when we talk about the Southern Yates and some of the other tribes, they don't need terror because they're not structured the same way we are. Exactly. So, and there's nothing that says that we have to have it. We're just trying to see, is there something better here for us? Well, let me just say this. I've, I've been here a long time. I've been a shareholder since 1972. I've seen the bad times. I've seen the good times. I saw where the nation took over a gift shop. They couldn't do that. I saw where they took over the grocery store. They couldn't do that. I'm concerned now about my quality of health care at the clinic. The nation took that over. And you talk about staff under the clinic. Where are all the choir having such a big turnover? We just lost our chief medical officer. We lost some COVID nurses. 
So I'm going to talk about that. And now I see that with this coming on, the nation finally has over certain functions of the BIA. I elected a veterans council to protect my asset. Not to put it at risk. And I see a terror as a risk. And you and you very well may still feel that way at the end of this discussion tonight. I don't know. And I don't know how I would feel. I'm telling you, I walked through that door tonight with the I'm still not going to vote for this. And I want to hear what they have to say. I want to give Dr. Trumbly the courtesy to, to walk us through this, although I hope that you don't go two hours with it. <laughs> um, I want to hear what Wilson has to say to some questions, some very pointed questions. I want to hear what he has to say. And at the end of the night, I may walk back over here to this table and go, girls, we're over here. This is all wrong. I don't know what the answer is, but I'm just saying, if, if you keep saying no, you're not, you're not even giving consideration to the possibility that if you, the shareholders, only wanted a small portion of the tariff, like, I gotta tell you, it really irritated me today that the, the, the superintendent and the regional director are like, no, we want these wells closed. We're terminating them. And I'm like, you don't know us. You're not the ones who are hungry out here. We are. Where's Rob Rehart? I need to know about these places. Mr. Rehart has chosen not to be here tonight. I don't know why. It, I, I heard somebody say, so all eight council members are here. Well, first of all, we only have seven. We lost our chairman. Uh, Ender? Yes. So we're down to seven. Uh, Chairman Waller was supposed to be here tonight. I don't know why he's kept late. He, I know he has complications today. The rest of us are here except for Susan, who can't come for uh, some other obligations, I saw. And uh, I'm not sure why Paul's not here. I think because he's healthy. He had some surgery recently. So I, I don't know. <coughs> What more to tell you about? Just listen and see if there's any piece of it that makes sense. If your answer is still no at the end of the day, every single member of the council will respect it. I didn't know you could force me this out. There, yeah, you can take bits and pieces of that. You can take very, you can take all of these things and we're done. I don't know, so I just put in the door. That, that has something else to be Well, I, I don't know because I can't see into the future what will happen. And I guarantee you, if I were sitting in your chair, not as a council member, I'd probably be just as loud as you are. But I want to hear what they said. I want to hear it. I want to know so that I can make an informed decision. You may still say no. You, you may still say no, but just listen to it. You didn't walk through the door right there. You know what's going to do? All they're playing out there. Well, before any terror agreement is signed, it will be sent to all council members. So I certainly can do with the county chair. And I'm giving you my word today. I may be a council member, but my term ends in one year and two weeks. I will be a shareholder for life. Well, you know, it was my motion that we have these community meetings, but I don't want to hear what everybody has to say. Yes, ma'am. And we're going live. We're going live. We're going live. I want to hear what they have to say. I don't want to hear what they have to say. I want to hear what they have to say. Okay. I don't want to hear what they have to say. I don't know. Got the internet over here? Is it working live here in this building? No, no, Do we have access to it? In I don't know. Huh? I got a
but 100% on Terra. But the more you learn, the more knowledge you gain, then you can see maybe this part we can do, exactly what we were talking about earlier. So when we talk about, let's start over here on the far left, let's do it the positive, the internal. Better overall management over permitting and internal controls. Authority to approve leases, business agreements, and related energy development. Control over environmental review, approval of management, and enforcement of leases and related agreements. I think she gave a perfect example of what happens when we don't have control over anything. So then you go with the positive on the external. Opportunity. Exerting tribal sovereignty. That's powerful. That's exactly what we should be doing here. I like it that I see a lot of heads nodding on that. Re-engage oil and gas producers. I can almost say that one over about and scream it. Engage oil and gas producers to come back and show them that we have now got new laws on the books. This is antiquated. This is, this is hurting us, it's killing us. The moment that we start taking control over having our own oil and gas laws, that's why we had the co, uh, part of the task force was members of Congress, members of the Office of the Chiefs, working hand in hand to see how can we do better for our shareholders and protect our mineral estate. Also, monetize. Increase and expedite business activity. Return to quarterly lease sales. Increase OSA head right holder payments. And really, this is a big one for us. We want the latest, most innovative technology that we can get here. We've been last on the list to get it. And there is new technologies that are out there for enhanced oil recovery. We don't want to be known as the group that's always just plugging wells or getting what's the scrape up, you know, at the bottom of the barrel. We have three things that are that work on our uh, with this new administration. We got oil, gas, and water. That makes hydrogen. There's a big push for hydrogen, and also on there's well plugging money available, and I don't want to steal. Councilman Rivera, Rick Horns. Uh, he's big on that right there. So, okay, so this is if we did Terra only with nothing else. So the witnesses are negative perception of the Osage Minerals Council and the Osage Nation working collaborative. People don't like to hear that we're working together, but every campaign they go, we want you all to work together. We've had collaborative meetings talking about this. False perception that Osage terror would break the trust relationship the federal government has had with the Osage. Look at the first two words. False perception. That's exactly what it is. We are not going to lose that. Additional funding required for the management of the mineral estate. You know, we only get a million dollars to oversee now, I'm gonna, we've heard so many different numbers, but we know we can actually say anywhere from 350 to 700 billion barrels of oil still on the ground. We can't get to it. So much heavy federal regulation. Even in the Osage uh, 1906 Allotment Act, it says that they are not to, to be in our way of, of doing our own mineral estate, producing it. But yet they are. So anyway, here's their other big threat. Potential retaliatory actions from the BIA and Department of Interior if we don't. We put this in here, this is before we had a transition of government. Governor Stitt's relationship with the tribes and one state committee impact. I'm not going to say their names, but we all know who's on that impact. They want Governor Stitt to run again and for to work with the government 
and try to take over our mineral state. We're going to be stopping them. Okay, next slide. So now, if we compact contract, we did a SWOT analysis on this. So we go over to the positive. So internally, the strength would be reoccurring annual funding. Exercise now, because with, when you compact contract with BIA, there is federal funding. Those are the monies that are there. That's, that's a big plus. Because then we don't have to go to, the, to uh, Congress and say, hey, we need help with some money. Exercise tribal sovereignty, again. It's putting us in control of our destiny. Because what is going on right now is not working. The ability to rebudget, reassign, reprogram the funding and streamline these processes. Here's the deal. We're going to be able to do it on our own terms. And that's what Osage has been lacking for a long time. No one thought we would be in gaming and be that successful. A regulatory part is, is you have uh, a Terra, which is a regulatory function. And then it's just like uh, with gaming, you have the uh, Osage Gaming Commission. You've got to have a regulatory body there, and that's what this is. On the other side, on this arm, we have the business development. That's what we want to be. So, um, so anyway, we have, there is also going to be carryover of the following year if funding is not spent. So we'll be able, we won't lose it. That's great. The opportunity here is the Osage Minerals Reservation is open for business. We want to tell, I know there's many um, Osage owned businesses that have had to just suffer and a lot of businesses that, you know, had to close because they didn't, they could not get into uh, our oil and gas business or maintain their businesses. So opportunity to have a government to government relationship and agreements for services. Again, our opportunity externally is exerting our tribal sovereignty. Re-engage the oil and gas producers in Osage County, increase and expedite business activity. So if we're able to do this, instead of 270 to 200 days, we will be able to do something within anywhere from 30 to 45 days. Why wouldn't we do something like that? From 270 to... 30 to 45. So on the negative, on the internal. Now this is on compact contract. Remember this part. Federal triggers are still applicable. Osage Nation assumes the responsibility of many federal functions. Perceived fear the Osage Minerals Council would control the accounting of the quarterly payment process and distribution. That's an inherent federal function. We would never do that. The money comes in, it goes to the BIA, it goes to the lockbox, and then it goes and gets paid up. Just like a status quo like it is now. The negative external threat, again, potential retaliatory actions from the Bureau of Indian Affairs and Department of Interior. Again, Governor Stitt's relationship with tribes and his one state committee impact. All right, so keep in mind that was just for uh, compact. Now what happens if we combine these two opportunities? On your internal and your positive, here's your strengths. Better overall management over permitting and internal controls. Authority to approve leases, business agreements, and related energy development. Control over your environmental review, approval, management, enforcement of leases, and rel uh, related agreements. Those are all positive internal strengths. Reoccurring annual funding. Exercise tribal sovereignty. Ability to rebudget, reassign, reprogram the funding to streamline the processes. Carry over the tribal, uh, uh, carry over to following year of funding that not spent. Again, the opportunity in our uh, exerting tribal sovereignty, and I, I think you can read all those. What we did is just blend those two together. And then again, this is the negative. You know, additional funding will be required with the management of the mineral estate. It, go ahead, Paul. 
Cargo also just thank you. <coughs> you're covering quite a bit of material on each one of these slides. And uh, the participants here may not be able to remember the information whenever you get to the end, the question and answer. Mm -hmm. Would it be beneficial as you cover a slide? Or is there any are there any questions before we move on? That's a good one. Do you want to go back to the first one? No. Oh, oh, okay. Okay. Oh, we did. Someone had a question. Oh, we're going to wait to that. All right. Well, evidently, no one wants to do Okay. So we'll just go to the next one. Oh, okay. So anyway, really, here's what happens at the next. Go to the next one. Terra compact contract findings. So, you know, I think we'll be, we just covered all three of them. But these are the four things that would be beneficial to, to the mineral state for us to regulate, for us to be able to, and then the next step would be to get in business development, which is a TETA. That would be the next thing we're working. Is this all going to happen next year? Probably not. This is a long-term process. Nothing happens real quick. So, okay, go to the next one. All right, this is you. And just to notice that the picture up in the corner is when we first started this opportunity, there is every member of the Minerals Council, the Osage Congress, and Office of the Chiefs. We had everybody in one room discussing what's going to be best for our shareholders, the nation, and the ability for us to move forward and to really look at what would be the best thing for our people and our future, our kids. Okay, thank you. Um, so before we get into the nitty gritty details, uh, a couple of things I want to point out. One, my task is not to advocate for or against her. My task was to keep the process moving. So that's what we've done. Second thing is, this is an organization chart for the regulatory body, not business development. This is not an oil and gas company. This is if we took over all of the contractual functions that the BIA currently does, it would need to have an organization something like this. Originally, the, the task force came together and they produced an org chart that was along the lines of 60 some odd positions, which was uh, way more than the BIA does, but at the same time, we think we can do uh, more with less. We can do more efficient, more effective management of the Osage Federal Estates with fewer people and, and do a better job of it. So this is kind of what we were looking at. And again, uh, it says this is subject to change. As this gets filled in, if uh, you guys and the Mineral Council decide to move forward, and they decide to stand up a regulatory agency, they're gonna start filling in this board chart and once they start doing that, especially when they get the executive director and some of the department heads, they're going to need to and want to have some of the latitude and flexibility to build the organization as they see fit, being the professionals that we're going to be looking for. But what we had was we had the executive director here, and then I think it's important to look at the functions because they correspond to the contractual functions that uh, we can take over from the BIA. The first one is subsurface leasing. That's going to be primarily a, a petroleum engineer and petroleum geologist looking at uh, reservoirs and, and what potentials are there. Then we'll have lease management. This has basically it's the it's a landman function where they're going out looking at leases and areas of managing that aspect of it as well. And then we've got enforcement and lease compliance. How do we know that the oil companies, we have, you know, I, I, we'd all like to think the oil companies are really great people and they're gonna take care of us, but 
you know, you still need a little oversight, right? And that's what this is, is that oversight enforcement, making sure that they do plug a well when they're supposed to, that they do have clean up these spells, they do other things like that that are necessary, and that they collect and report the uh, production accurately and things like that. Then we have operations supervisor from, from a uh, petroleum, well, the enforcement links, we also not only have a real, real estate, but we have environmental specialists and a geographic information system specialist, a, 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 a guy that does maps, right, a mapologist. And of course, we have records management. The operations uh, supervisor here, we're looking at petroleum technicians, uh, program support and records management, they're the ones that are going to go out and look at um, the actual production, the, the equipment, the tank farms, uh, making sure that accurate information is collected and gathered so we know exactly what's going to happen. And then we have the um, Information Technology Department, uh, Oil and Gas Attorney, and Oil, I think, this, I think, is one of the most important things that we need to have and have is oil and gas accounting and auditor. The oil accounting and gas accounting and doing audits. Because right now, uh, we, are respond we are taking the word of the superintendent as to what actually really happened. You know, we, you know they, they, they tell us what they've received and what, what it is. And, you know, we have no way of verifying that. We don't have any way of doing an audit for that. So that is kind of what we were thinking about. So it kind of gives you an insight into what we were thinking, the task force was thinking when they were putting this together. Are there any questions on that part? That is the that is definitely the, that was, a, that was a, a hot topic in all of our debates, and we insist that we have to have access to all of our well records. All of our records. We aren't just people. Yep. I said we were going to call it So I, I, I was, uh, I grew up in an old gas family. My father was a geologist. Uh, my sister uh, was a geologist as well, and I was a geological draftsman controlling the land. I know the importance of records. <laughs> Absolutely correct. That's why the local district won't have. Yep. Yep. So that's why we have records management at each one of these functions. Yeah. Any other questions on this before we move on? Okay. Well, that's the next part. So these are our cost estimates. What we did was we looked at splitting them up into two two functional areas. One is the startup cost. And then the ongoing operational cost. The startup cost, we focused on capital expenses and equipment, uh, overhead and admin necessary for the startup, first year labor as well, uh, and then additional consulting, accounting, and setting, setting up things like that to get the uh, stand up the regulatory body. Uh, I'm coming to that. Um, I, will, I promise we'll talk about that. You're a perfect straight person because that's exactly who I'm leaning into. Right here, there's our startup cost estimates. So the initial startup cost estimates come out. We estimated it at three point, just under three point five million dollars. By far, the bulk of that is uh, the first year labor expense at two point six. Uh, capital expenses and equipment at 700, just over 700,000. Overhead and uh, admin O and A startup, and consulting at 52,000 for the initial startup cost. Uh, we initially took our estimates. We wanted to be high uh, on all of our overheads and all of our cost estimates, and so we took uh, our facilities and capital equipment. From, as if we were in Tulsa. We think there, there would be some savings that we would have if we could do a lot of that here, but all of our cost and, and labor pools and labor rates, we, we drove uh, using the Tulsa market. Again, so we could have 
I've always maintained it's better to estimate your costs too high and your revenues too low. Because <laughs> you, if you come in the other way, that's much better. So that's the initial startup cost. Uh, the annual operating cost, our annual labor cost is 2.6. The rent and facilities, we, we figured it was 96, just, just short of uh, $100,000 a year. The vehicle cost is $75,000 a year. That's maintenance and ongoing replacement depreciation. Uh, additional cleaning and, and management, maintenance, and things like that, plus utilities, uh, which would include electricity, oil, and gas, or electricity, gas, um, internet, phones, all that stuff, all those utility investments as well. And generally, yes? Uh, I didn't attend very many meetings myself. Uh, but I remember one meeting I just sit in. That was when we had the original. Why that change? Well, that was when we had the original organizational chart with almost sixty some odd people, and we scaled that back because uh, we knew that that was going to be uh, the, the Cadillac, if you will, and, and sometimes you need to start off with a shift. Is this the reality of that? Yeah, it's just it's the reality of standing up a startup. Well, that is <laughs> Councilperson Gray here is going to talk to that. So, if you remember, uh, gosh, in the past year or so, um, we had, the nation had hired a strategic plan update for 2020-2025. And when it came down to anything that had to do with the Osage Minerals Council, increased transparency and communication between the Osage Minerals Council and handwriting holders. holders. So here we are. The ones who want to be here, we're here. The other thing is, is that we wanted to make sure that, uh, and, you know, I will say this with Councilwoman Harlan and myself, before we moved forward, we raised our hand and said, we want to take this to the shareholders and get some input. We cannot make this decision without having input. So that's why we're here today. So if you, uh, that's why we want to get your input. And we'll, I'm not going to start I know, that's my next slide. But so we had we followed along what the strategic plan said, but they got nationwide information. Provide more information and education to Osage members about probates, head rights, and other such topics. I know that the League of Nation, Terry, Mason Moore over there, I think that they are uh, compact contracting probate. Do you know how many people we get to come to us every week, phones that ring and say, my family's case has been in probate for 10 years, eight years, five years. When will it be settled? When will it be settled? So that's another reason why the nation is taking that under. Because that's unacceptable. It's unacceptable. So uh, develop Osage owned businesses related to the oil industry. That's what the other progressive tribes have done. If we had the opportunity to show you what the Southern U oil and gas looks like, they're, they were at the beginning of this, and they are a billion dollar tribe because of it now. It's insane why we have not, we can't, get, we can't get out of this conversation to get to the conversation of why aren't your checks, um, you know, quarterly checks 10 times what they are now. Well, during that year, we understand COVID. But prior to that, when you got 270 days to get a permit and no one was fighting that fight, um, that's why we want to look at something different. Am I a hundred percent am I a hundred percent for this? I'm like you all, I want to find more information. So how do we get the money? I appreciate your uh, passion for this, but there's other people here just out of respect. We can't. So, um, 
welcome. You're welcome. I'm, well, when we can raise your hand, I mean, I'll answer you any time, Linda. But let me get through this slide, then I'll take your answer. So under potential funding, we have been really successful with the Department of Interior and DEMD grants. Now, just when we get to be successful, what happens? The Bureau of Indian Affairs says we're going to take DEMD, which is the Division of Energy Minerals Development, I read in that department, and we have been, we've got probably how much in grants over the past three years? Something about 1.5, and right now we have two other asks for minerals development, for hydrogen, for uh, I think uh, council has a council right. or second right. sand and gravel. Yeah. So we have all these different things that we're looking at. So then you go to other revenues, and we're just estimating that at about seventy-five thousand federal funding. This number, we didn't update this because right now we are in the middle of a $10 million ask. So that federal funding could be going up. Also, if we do a compact contract, that number will increase. We're just kind of showing you this is potentially what it's going to take. Tribal funding, I'm going to say this to uh, those members. Uh, I think I just have, but we have one Congress member in here. We're in this Constitution, too. Just like you receive money to run your office, it'd be nice for you guys to give us some money to run our office. Sure. We have uh, three districts here. We're in this beautiful building, New Arbor. We hear you're getting a new senior citizen. Those are great things, fitness centers, all these different things that we're doing. But is our government investing in our mineral estate? Are they investing in helping us? That's where we need your voice. Because it takes money to make these decisions and to move us forward. Our job is to really increase your check. Find other forms of way to do it. It's in the Constitution, right here. Go to page 22. We read it every time. Ma'am, you have a question? Yeah, I have a question. Where is the money coming from? What are you going to do? Yes, it does. Yeah, it does. And who's going to be responsible for that money? It has to be at least four or five million dollars. Okay, I'm going to run this by. We just talked about it. Federal funding, compact contract, okay. negotiating. How do we know what money we're going to get? It's when we get into negotiations with the federal government. When we sit down there across the table from them. When we look across the table, like I'm looking at you, federal government, you owe us this. You owe us this. So that's how we go. And you want truth negotiators at that table. You have to be transparent with the mineral state I don't know what, what do you mean transparent with the mineral state? So how do you get where the money goes? Where are they coming from the back? Where are the food? Oh, you're talking about social media. Okay, well that's a, that's another conversation. But we're on we're on the tariff. When you want to talk social media, that's another one. I want to talk about tariff. Well, that's what we're asking, ma'am. I'm telling you. No. The, yes. I, okay, I'm telling you where the money is. D E M D. So uh, tribal funding. I just got insane looking over there, at Council Congresswoman. I mean, Congresswoman. Congresswoman Fox. We need to go, we've gone before them and asked them, how do you get the money out of Terra? Is you negotiate it at the table once you're in, once we sign the application, that's if we do, that's if we do, then you begin 270 days of negotiation. If the money isn't there, I'm walking away. Or is it the money in there? No, who said that? Well, that was the old administration. Is that right? Weren't we there during the old administration? No. I wasn't yeah. There. Well, you were, you were there. I was there as a. Yeah. And they said, well, there's no funding yet. That's right. 
New administration? We go to the table. We will be with, we will, it's both. It's going to be both. Because the minerals, it would be overreaching if Chief just went, if he said, I don't need the Minerals Council to make this, I'm just going to go on my own. Can't do it. Why? The book that we don't like. Okay, but here's the deal. The very same people that complain that my check isn't enough are the same people that are saying that this won't work. And I'm telling you, this is what we're trying to get to a point of, you know, how this will be funded. Go ahead, next slide. Jim. Next slide. <laughs> Jim, number Okay. I'm not going to read all this because what is in a tariff? Is um, it's already come, Wilson? It's all you on this. And then after uh, Wilson, we'd like to hear from the other um, council members. Yeah. I'm sorry. He's got a question. Who just saw some respect? I know there's a lot of confusion about this contract. It wasn't me. Yeah. So, with regard to a self governance contract, you hear people talk about a 638 contract or a 638 compact. That is where an Indian tribe can ask the Bureau of Indian Affairs for certain functions. We will take those over, and they necessarily have to let you do that. And you get the federal funds for those. Right? So a compact or compact necessarily would go with a tariff because the Department of the Interior has decided that the contract compact function is how you get federal dollars to a tribe. So if there is to be a tariff, there would necessarily have to be a self-governance contract or compact because that's how federal funds flow from the United States to a tribe. Okay. That's the avenue that they said they that, that those monies would flow. Councilman said. So um, I think Jim went to get some tea. Right there. <laughs> it's okay. So uh, that's, I think this is, we can come back to this too, because I think a lot of, what I think would be useful is, if we can, well, let's finish the presentation, and then we can come back to some of this. But okay, so what is in the tariff? If the Minerals Council decided we want to take over as much of the functions, or as many of the functions, as we can take over, this is what those functions would be. Okay. Pre-leasing, tract evaluation and records management. Leasing, we would handle lease sales, we'd negotiate leases, bonding, environmental and cultural resources would be records management. Okay, lease approval, lease assignments, unitizations, overrides, lease termination and cancellation. Taking royalties in kind, managed records, notice of administrative review. Okay, does any of this look familiar? Why is that? Because we basically already do a lot of this stuff, right? We're involved in that leasing process. So this, this should not be the wizard behind the curtain where there's some brilliant federal employees at the agency that know how to do this that's unlearned. Okay? Then there's permitting and operations. Now, when you look at the idea of an application for drilling work over a plugging permit, application for a permit to drill, that is one of the items that is most attractive to taking for doing a tariff. Again, there's a lot of things that you cannot like about a tariff. One of them is, in the world of business, this APD, they call it, 
application for a permit to drill is one of the slowest federal processes. When Councilwoman Gray talked about all the time it takes for a company that goes to the superintendent and says, okay, I've got my lease, now I need a permit to drill. That's the one that's taking months and months to get to the point that nobody wants to do business here. Paul Gates, am I right about that? Okay, so Paul's been a superintendent himself. So easements, operations, records management, notice of administrative appeal. That would be some, those are functions currently carried out by the Bureau of Indian Affairs that the Osage Minerals Council or departments of the Osage Nation would carry out. Okay, lease compliance and enforcement. So that's, as, as Dr. Trumbly said, how do we make sure the companies are doing what they're supposed to be doing? Right, we don't just, we're not on just a truly trusting system. So there's inspection, investigation, dealing with theft, uh, all a number of other things related to making sure that a company with a lease is in compliance with the rules and there's enforcement for that. And then for production oversight, making sure there's verification of local loss or, or waste of production, records management, those. Okay, that's that's what that is the universe of things that is potentially be taken over. Okay. That's the full list. That's the scary list right there. Okay. Okay, the next thing. What's not in the tariff? This is basically those things that the federal government has told us you can't take these over. These are inherently federal functions. So the archaeological permit. We don't like, you know, the, we have an office that does that. We think we do it more efficiently. They said you can't take that over. Endangered Species Act. That's what the American Barrier Beetle. All that has caused such a slowdown in production here. They're saying you can't take that over. Minerals Council we think found a workaround for that. We just got to get it finalized. But it's not. Uh, collection of and accounting for revenues from the mineral estate. Now this is one they want to let us do, but they're not. They've decided this is inherently federal. This is like this is the record keeping on money that comes in. Now, collection is a little bit different, right? This means that the government is not, the federal government would still be collecting all the money and then doing what? Investing all the money and then distributing the hit record. The Minerals Council would not be, have their hands on that at all, okay? Settlement of surface damages. Well, we kind of wish we could do that one too, but that's a whole other surface story. Making payments to head right holders, paying the gross production, uh, making tribal operating expense payments, operations on restricted Indian lands, issuance of notices, orders and notices, civil penalties and assessments, FOIA, records management. Again, this is a point of contention that the Minerals Council has beat its head against the wall of the federal government. It's a major slowdown. But we're, we think in a tariff, it's another opportunity to negotiate. I'm not going to tell you that we're necessarily going to get that here. That's a fight. That is a fight that we're in the middle of. Information collections and administrative appeals. These are the things that are not in a tariff because the Department of Inter Interior has told us to continue the trust, the Osage trust. You are not allowed, to, these are not eligible to take over. Okay. The main part of that is the money part, to be honest with you. Collection of funds, investment of funds, and distribution of funds to head right holders. Okay. Those are inherently federal, so it would not be that. So, now collection of funds, that's, you know, that's when, you know, and when we sued the United States for mismanagement of the uh, Osage Minerals. Anybody know what was the what was the, the most dollars in that lawsuit because of the federal government shortcomings? Anybody know? Cynthia Moon, you remember the Minerals Council? I remember that it was the federal government That's right, three hundred eighty. But the most of that money, you know what it was? There was a lease with a company. And they were required to pay a certain amount of money into the United States for that lease. 
and there was not a check on the amount that was paid. They just did not collect the money. So under collection of royalties was a huge amount of that money. The BIA just didn't collect the money and did not require oil companies to collect what they were, the head right holders were owed. So that's something we will not be able to take over. But again, that is, these are the things that the Department of the Interior has said are off the table. Okay, yes, sir. But we would, we would be able to monitor that production, and so we would know that they didn't collect the money faster. Yeah. We know, we know sooner, and we could go tell them that. Okay, so can you go back to the slide before this? The one before this, uh, what is it? This is the scary list here. Here's what the Minerals Council would be doing. But I probably, Environmental and Cultural Resource Review, some of these things would probably be done by an office within the Osage Nation Executive Branch, because they're already doing it. Right. So why would we create the same office that's already doing uh, environmental reviews under the Hearth Act? Because this is, in my mind, just an area of efficiency. Now, if you don't like the idea, if you think that's the nation's takeover of the mineral estate, that's what it is. Okay? That's what the takeover of the mineral estate is right there. If you're worried, that's what you got to worry about. Yes? So, Wilson, just as a point of clarification, when we say the Minerals Council will be doing this, it will not be a elected official. No, no, no. Let's just keep reminding yes. that there will be professionals right. who are going to be assigned this, and Minerals Council will still be just an oversight body. That's right. So okay. if you look at the the org chart, where it shows the these would be persons hired by the Minerals Council. Okay. So under the Osage Constitution, the Minerals Council has authority to create to administer the mineral estate and hire people and do these things. You, you can think of it like uh, the mineral council would be the board of directors, if you will, the oversight board. Okay. But you're, I think Councilman Har Harlan makes a great point. It's not the elected officials who are over there saying, well, I guess who's the German geologist today? You know, it's not that. It's This is a group of hired people by the Minerals Council, where they would have to hire a they would have the money to do it. And so if it's working right, then they're, they're accountable to the Minerals Council, who's directly accountable to the head right holders, as opposed to you know, just the superintendent, which is not accountable. They're, they're more accountable to the regional director or federal body. You know. So, um, but that's it. That's the... Look behind the curtain. That's the now there's things to worry about here, aren't there? Mm -hmm. I think. You want to go down to again what's the I mean, you're talking about 24 employees here in our best estimate right now. 24 employees. This is a bureaucracy that doesn't exist right now. Except for the agency. The agency has is supposed to be doing this. But one of the advantages of the Terra is that if they can't hire, they can't find the agency can't find people for that, it just sits empty. And the work doesn't get done. Right? Whereas if it's the Minerals Council or the nation, then they're accountable to try to find somebody or you know, try to solve the problem in a different way. Now the downside for being transparent here is there hasn't been this kind of bureaucracy created by the Minerals Council before. Right? That is what it is. So okay. Yes. Because this is a this has always been a sticking point for me, but because this is a contract between the Osage Nation and the federal government. When this agency is created, even though we, the Minerals Council provide that oversight, what day-to-day -day role is anticipated for 
the administration. If you could explain that to everyone. Okay. So, can we go back now? Now, oh, I will say that in my mind, and again, this is all subject to when we get into a negotiation with the United States, if it gets that far, my expectation would be that essentially all of this bureaucracy would be under the Minerals Council. All of this part of the bureaucracy, right? The real mineral stuff. Right, oil and gas production, minerals production. Now, if we go down to the what it is, what it's what it's here. Some of these things, like pre-leasing, again, this is just me talking here. This is I'm not expressing the views of the minerals council here. Pre-leasing, leasing, these things would be minerals council. On the leasing part, the environmental and cultural resource review would probably be done by the Department of Natural Resources with the Executive Branch of the Association. Because they're already doing it. They're already doing it. Okay. Records management, at some point, that probably involves the Osage Nation archives. Right? Now, some of these things, you could, there's, they, they would have to figure out how to do minerals records. Okay? So it's not to say you just take them all over there. Lease approval, my thought on this is these are probably Minerals Council functions, except for maybe all records management. Notice an administrative appeal. There may be a creation of a process where the Minerals Council is ultimately the decider on that. Right? Permitting, that's the heart of this. How do we get to a more efficient permit to drill? Somebody comes in and says, why would I do business with you when I can go to Pawnee County? And it takes me so much less time to get a permit to drill. Well, we're going to say we've got well, we've got a mineral estate that's less one owner. You just have to deal with us. We're trying to create an environment for you where you want to come here and do business with us. And they say, why is it taking us six months to get a permit to drill? Why would we ever do that? Well, we've got a new system here. It's a we're going to try to do it in sixty days. Yes. So on that, since you mentioned application for the drill, do we have the data so? We're looking at 240 to 270 days here. We have the data of what it takes to drill in, not, not in the neighboring county, but in, in Southern Utah territory. Because I'm familiar with Southern Utah operation a little bit. Um, they actually have a gathering system and gas plants that are 400 miles from their plants. They're, they're in the oil. Yeah, there's not out there. So do we know? data on how long it takes to drill on their land? Surprisingly, I think the answer from the Department of the Interior is that it still takes them a long time to get a permit to drill there, even under their system. But right. also, but also um, Red Little, they buy our, they buy their trade arc gas on our lines, and they make the money, we don't, they pay the royalty. But it makes sense for us to be doing it ourselves. <laughs> the, the surprising answer to that is that when you're dealing with an Indian tribe on trust land, there's still all these federal requirements that make it slower than on fee land. Uh, not to be uh, call her uh, last time the BIA told us that I don't know get it from you. It's 150 days. They're still on time. 150 days. So okay, so 115 days. So the so the BIA will tell you with great pride on how much time they're cutting off on the time it takes for them to get a permit done. Am I right about that? Superintendent will come in here and tell you. I guess what? We're down to 115 days. Isn't that crazy? Great. You should love me now. Get after me anymore. I'm getting it down, right? So. Uh, they recognize this problem to get to a permit to drill. Right? They recognize that. They've also said they realize too much material, you can probably do it faster, but it's not going to be overnight. It's not like going to, you know, on fee land and you know, but somewhere where it's not always. Okay? But that's the sort of things that if you break it down and take a close look, 
some of these things are, that's the scary thing is that the Minerals Council and the nation would be doing. Minerals Council, I'm right about that. Paul, am I right about that? Excuse me. Don't know. Okay, I, I don't have any health information to respond to that. Okay, so, so, so you're, am I to summarize your point? That you're, okay, if you could go back to the, the pros and cons of the contract compact, because what I understand is you're saying this is a weakness, right, of a tariff and compact combined here. That the Osage Nation does a bad job at everything that or a lot of what it does. Is that right? No, no. They do their work and they, it takes they still have to go to the Bureau of Indian and have the superintendent sign on. So when they take me over three years to get some land, I'm up to the south, get all the paperwork in, archaeological study, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's still not done. And my lease was done. It's a nightmare. Their compact is a nightmare. Just because we still have to, we're doing all the grunt work for the Bureau. I mean, all we're doing is subsidizing their money because they don't want to put out any money to do anything for us. We're actually doing their work. Now, are you talking about the nation or the Bureau? I'm not talking about the nation. The nation still does, really does all the grunt work, but when it's all said and done, that superintendent still has to approve that lease. For her to prove that, it has to be sent out to different people. I'm telling you, it's a it's so, Okay, so let me let's take that analogy here. So, if I, so you're talking about in a realty situation, you have to do all the, the nation does the grunt work, but the superintendent's taking a long time to prove. Yes, yes. Okay, now isn't that an argument for a tariff? <laughs> because if you're saying the nation can do it, but you don't need the superintendent's approval. Because that is one of their trust responsibilities. That's what I'm saying. Why, where's the list? I missed it. Somewhere, there's a list of the trust responsibility, inherent responsibilities. Where yes. is this list? Yes, right here. I'll show you. Go back to the things that we cannot. Is it in this, is it in this area? Yes, yes. Okay. So right. this is the all aspects of very, okay, inherently federal functions. So, if, if somebody says, if you enter into a tariff, they're going to kick the BIA off. They're gone. There's no trust. These are all the things that they're going to continue to do under any at the, any environment. So, is there still a trust responsibility? Of course, there is. The federal law does not allow us to violate that if we wanted to. Yes, ma'am. Insurance. Okay, so you're talking about the clinic and the health insurance doesn't work like it should. No, and you're giving this to the nation. In the settlement of surface damages for restricted Indian landowners, we've lost our identity. That don't give a damn about us. They ignore us. They don't care. How can you tell somebody if you want to sell your land? You, the other side of the nation has first tried to refuse. But let me see. So this is a, but this is not something that we would would be in a tariff. The settlement of surface damages. That's what, that is would remain a federal function. But what I'm saying is, with the other federal functions that are going to remain, how are we going to operate without the tariff? Our doctor is the most important thing that we have. I'm telling you, you better believe this Minerals Council is 
completely agrees with you. We're dealing with a hard-headed bunch of bureaucrats on this. I will tell you. I'll tell you what he's saying. His name's Ken Dalton. He's the solicitor in Washington D.C. He said that until we signed the the uh, agreement not to, uh, he said that not to sue and take responsibility, but they not be responsible for anything that happens to us. I agree with you. The federal government would love to not be able to be sued by us. That's really good. Yes. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm just going here. Thank you, Wilson. I'm Tolly Gregorn. I'm on the OSX General Council. Before I get started, I just want to introduce our staff. Uh, go ahead and stand up, staff. You're here. Go ahead. Lynette Turley, wave your hand. And Anna McKibben, Pipe Stem, who kind of recently joined us. So. Are you here? Who is it? That's my sister in law. My brother walked across my. Oh, how much? So we're, we're glad to have them. They're, they're, they're really a, a good group of individuals. And uh, thank y'all very much for all the work you do. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Pogstein mentioned the compact and then the tariff. I just want to say, I'm going to start off this. Does anybody know the most prolific? We've got going right now. Go ahead, sir. It's Purdue Web City. Without Purdue it, Web City. Without it, close to half of our production would be gone. Exactly. It's gone. Purdue is producing somewhere around 3,800 barrels a day. What's unique about the Purdue production? It's a CO2 flood. But what does the CO2 flood then do? It turns, everybody knows water and oil don't mix. Like I, I've been told, Tali, you and I are like water and oil, we don't mix. <laughs> you know? But CO2 at miscible pressures and oil do mix. And they get together and then they, they move together toward production. And that's a unique opportunity that the Mineral Council has approved and looked for and it's working and going in this gentleman's right. As that one's going up, what's going on with the rest of the administration? Production is going down. Why is it going down? Because the producers can't get in drill. Because the producers can't get in drill. Why? Correct. So I'm hearing you don't get information. They take, well, we just said 270, 150 days to get a permit. You know, I mean, these are things that will drive a business toward the ground. They don't care who doesn't care. You're not. They don't care. You know, they used to have a full-blown patrolling department. They had, oh, hey, get out here. They had a whole list of engineers. And, and Parker, Roger, Lynn. We had three engineers and uh, an extra from the engineering technician. Van Bayhorst and I could get a permit out the door in two days. Mm -hmm. We used to do it at London. What happened? What happened? Stop, stop. Yeah, it's a one-stop shop. I've been told by elders of the Osage, you know, we had a very high IQ. We, people thought highways, the Bureau, took seriously. We walked in the door and had a problem. Something's happened, I don't know. <clears throat> but now we're, we're in the background. When you're talking 115 days to 270 days to get a permit, Mr. Poxton's talking about information records management. This is our biggest value. Perdure. 
I know some of the guys that worked on the Purdue when I worked with Connor Phillips. What's unique about that? They did a lot of research in that area. Phillips Petroleum. <clears throat> and I believe the reason Purdue is active and available is they got a whole of that information. There's certain areas where they studied and studied hard. They've got cores, they've got a lot of petroleum information in that one field. Yes. I hear that. They do. They do. Why is it in the rest of the reservation? <clears throat> Why has the Purdue taken off? And I'll tell you, we've done some research. We got a DMD grant, and we're finding way more areas out there that are more prolific, just like this. But what's the problem? What's the problem? They can't get their information. Yeah, but everybody wants information. They don't want somebody else's information. They want to figure it out for themselves. That's the core of being a controlling professional. They want, they'll take your ideas, yeah, but everybody wants their own information so they can assess it. And Mr. Pipestem's right. This has become our biggest battle. Because once we open up that, that information, we get these guys coming in and they find more and more revenue out there. And we're seeing tons of it. I heard one council person, mineral council, say to the nation, you guys operate with millions of dollars of revenue. The mineral council is responsible for billions potential revenue. So as Mr. Pikeston is saying, and some of these other mineral councils, we need to go after and start acting like some of these bigger tribes that are going after those extra barrels. And that's what we're trying to do here. Our biggest hurdle, my belief is this one, the records. Once we get our, a handle on those records, I start seeing guys coming in the door. We open up just a little bit over here, here they come. Why? Because they're out there looking for a deal. They don't care about all this politics. They're looking for what's the next sweet spot out there. And I believe West Coast State is one. And we're finding more and more DMD starting before they just ignore us. And now they're all about the Osage because they're all oil and gas. We're fighting another fight. What is that? The new DOI people, they do not like oil and gas. And Deb Haley Holland, she's one of the biggest advocates. She's a green person. So she does not like that it's all about zero emissions. But they recognize, I think it was Gray went up there, to the NCAI and talk to them. They passed a resolution that said the Os we recognize the Osage right to go after their oil and gas. That's big. So that changes the conversation. Is that a law? I said just a resolution. A bunch of Indians saying we agree that the Osages can go after their resources. Yeah. Well, I know. I'm saying that you got people in the DOI that are green that are named, and they want to shut down all the gas. I'm just saying, it's, it's a big game, it's a big fight, but we're trying to, to, to tackle these big questions. It's no longer a small fight. It's big, it's national. We got records, we got DOI in the high school, locations, and government, now Biden. These are big fights. We're trying to keep this Osage Reservation open so we can go after our barracks and drill. So I just want to say, that the, the, the thing about the Perdur is it hits right on the records management. It hits right on where I think our next challenge is. We are successful. Somebody ordered all those records from north to south in there. Well, I'm, I'm, I watch it day in and day out. We have 
a geologist, we have, you know, we've got all this information, we're trying to get it from the BIA, and once we start handing out trickles of it, it's, it's priceless. So we need to get better at it. Go after the, all the records. You heard somebody say, tall leaves for this. Well, I'll tell you why. Because I want to walk in that BIA and say, you guys get out of here. These are all records. Just get on well, they're not going to leave there. You're going to have to call it. I don't think they're there. Why, why did the status of the records change all of a sudden? And is that there, I don't know. Is there a law? Is it in the CFR? Is there, is there something that they can stand on and say, this is why we can keep the records? Well, it started as soon as Cynthia was on there and Stephanie was on the council in 2014. All of a sudden, here comes this FOIA. But I've asked the question, how come you guys don't FOIA all this information on um, personal information and they care about all this oil and gas? It's two separate questions and answers. In 1974, they did that. But the, the, the core of what we were told was, you guys get, if you guys have real estate, you get the records. And I'm big enough, my hand went up, well, what about oil and gas? If we walked in there and contract, wouldn't we get all the records? Yes, you would. There's a CFR. So then Tali becomes an advocate and walk in the door because I'm convinced this is holding our reservation back. Yes. Yeah. You know, Matthew? Oh, thank you. Here's the Charlie man. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. There is a CFR in the 226 section of the oil and gas management records, and it's number 26.30. I call it the, the Queen Bee Clause because the superintendent can make up the rules and, and you have to follow everything she says. So she put the FOIA in place so our, that'll slow our, our process down. But, no, but it's in the CFR. No, I didn't like that, but they're whatever. They're bound to determine. So you get the Bureau of Land Management, all their rules, 25 cedar farms, or whatever. They want all that stuff incorporated here. And they want okay, to I, and everything else. I want to say, I believe Purdue has shown to me, at least, and our mineral council and folks out there, that when you have a big game plan, you think a little bit differently about technology, as Ms. Gray talked about. You get the record, get your hands on the records. You got all these elements working for you. And bingo, I'll say it becomes a big play. 3,800 barrels of that. And they want to sell them. Why? Why do they want to sell them? 50 years ago, they got a 50, 60 year plan. They just don't want to go out there and start pulling all this oil. What's that? That's where I want to go. I want to go to these other areas. If, if this is working well, what about around here? What about around this little area? Okay. So, you know, this word, that's why I'm saying Terra is starting to become more attractive because now I'm saying, okay, with Terra, we don't have the superintendent in the room. What's the bureau doing? They're looking at our plan. Oh, yeah, it looks good. They approve it. We keep going. There's no there's no compact contract. They do the blank work, and then it goes to superintendent for final approval. That's not there anymore. I think there's one one step in there, but that's only solved one. I just want to be clear. That's the difference between tariff and compact contract. Yes. Did we just learn that today. Yeah. We wanted it open, they shut it down. And you can't the best Well, if we had a tariff, could 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 they shut shut it down? We set the priority as a trial, as a measure. And see everything you can do back there. Because if you start getting into little problems, you can throw us off. I agree with you. Yeah. That's as Mr. Pike said, that's the scary part of it. But we're in a new, new location now. Just like when's the first time, I'm sorry you got your hand up, can I tell this story I'm gonna write to you? What's the first time we've dealt with the United States in those stages? Oh my God, 1803, 
a Louisiana purchase, and the other stages were standing there watching with Louis, I mean, the Louis, the guy, the Louis and Clark, and, and what happened in 1806? Here comes Zebulon Montgomery Pike as an official from the United States, visiting the other stage. A hundred years before that 1906 act, we started dealing with the United States. In 1908 or 1808, a tree, 1825, another tree, then we start getting into Kansas. In 1870, I believe we had our own constitution. We had the surface and the minerals. Do y'all remember that? Yeah, they did away with it. They did away with it. Why? 1906 came in. 1906 came in, and all of a sudden, there, I was hearing, they're making a movie about it. <laughs> there, you know, there's something in the water. What's going on? Well, now I believe it's our chance to go back and grab what's rightfully ours. And it's a sovereign movement. Terror is a sovereign movement. That's why I believe we need to really look at this strong. It's a new day. It's not the old. Sorry, go ahead. I got a question for you. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, so I absolutely agree that the records management is a huge uh, contention here. And sort of agree with what uh, what Cynthia is saying too, that there is that. Well, I never thought of it as a queen bee uh, provision, but but it, but really what this came out even just because the chief asked said, how do we get our records back and, and we get this solicitor's opinion that says, oh, you have to have a FOIA. But then we kind of, then they kind of danced around about why and what was in it and, and all of this. So my question comes back to, short of a terror, could, if we had our information, like Wilson was explaining earlier, we do a lot of this already. If we had information, would we be able to get drilling going again? Or do you think all of the things that come with Terra are necessary components to get us back to where we need to be? I, well, <clears throat> you're asking about the records. The records are trickling through with the redacted process, yeah. which means, and it was working well until COVID. <clears throat> So the, the records we were able to get, we just shot an arrow at night, hit an area, sent that to them, bam, all of a sudden, here comes these producers. Oh man, they're looking at it. They said, man, there's a lot of activity out here that we're really interested, in, you know. So we shot them another. Oh man, here's more records. So I'm starting to see this is this is what's holding us back. And I ask, well, what's going on with Perdura? 3,800 barrels a day. They got all these records and they started. They don't want to expand anymore. And I think maybe it's because they can't get any more records. Or heck, they would have been all up and down that area. But they're, they're finding out that there's some prolific areas out there just like the bourbon that we can go and attack. And it takes new technology. It's like a new way. It's like, yeah, go ahead. Well, I, I can't speak for the nation. We still have a rep here from the nation. He left. You want, you want to, Wilson's going to take a shot at that one. Well, I don't know. I, all I know is what I've heard Chief Sanders And his, his, his view is that it is worth doing just because it's an exercise of sovereignty over our own territory. It's an exercise of self-governance over our own natural resources. Now, he's also saying if the Minerals Council doesn't do a terror, then he's not, you know, he can't do it without the Minerals Council because he's not constitutionally permitted to go forward without it. Yeah, you right. mean you can't form an oil company with the nation of the and they can't present the Oh, yeah, but that's totally different. That's not anywhere near this. That's what, but you raised that. 
You, you suggest what I said is something very, that's weird. This is something completely different from a tariff. You just described something entirely different from a tariff. But could he do that? Of course. Anybody could do that. You, we could all get together and say, we're starting a oil company today. We've got to get the revenue. We've got to try to find places we go drill. It's private sector. Who, who can make the rules for these things? Is it going to be Congress passing rules for the Minerals Council? No, it's the Minerals Council. Just totally the Minerals Council. No, no. On the oil and gas stuff, right? No, because, well, the Congress would have to authorize this. The nation, this would be a action where the chiefs and the um, Osage Congress would certainly have to be involved, right? On some of these things we've spoken about, on the, Jim, did you do the last, the what's it is in the term? Some of these things, they may have to amend their laws to say that we're gonna do environmental and cultural resources in the if there is a tariff, right? So they would have to change the law there, I think. But I'm not sure. I was one of the programs that Mr. Reddy and I started was Orphan Well and looked at 1,600 orphan wells and 552 leases that are abandoned. And the BI was not doing anything about it. They just rolled for years. So we got the Orphan Well Grant, we reviewed those, trying to find value out of those wells. Majority of them, as Mr. Andrew Yates would say, 90% of probably need to be plugged, and he was right on. But that 10% is out there. So today, our well plugging committee has plugged 34 wells and found 11 keepers. That's 34 wells and 11 keepers the BI didn't do and will not do. This program is funded through the nation, but the nation lets the Mineral Council roll. There is an agreement between Candy Thomas and the nation to, for us to get the three million that you two fought for and got for. And now it's rolling. So we're going to go ask for 10 more million. Hopefully we'll get it to plug more wells. We've got a lot of wells to plug. I just wanted to give y'all, this is one example of a nation being the top dog if they're allowed for the Federal Council to roll with the entire program. Are you plugging, are you plugging wells that are producing and paying them out and paying quantities? Say, I'm sorry, I missed your question. Are, you, are there oil wells that are being plugged that are producing and paying? No, but the wells we're plugging are wells that we did another assessment for economics and that it wasn't there. So we had, and then we had, to, we had to give the BIA a list of emergency wells. This is problem wells, drinking water, whatever. Fluid levels too high, so we tag those. And those are getting plugged. I'm taking fire from Paul Rivar. He's running the plug, a well plugging program. But I just wanted you to know I think the terror is going to run in the same vein. They're going to kind of handle the money, but the minerals is going to control the whole thing. It's really where they will ask folks for the nation. And we've got staff now that are getting booted up and they're working daily with the BIA. So that's my feeling is the terror is going to roll like the Plugging program. And what you just told me is uh, not what I'm hearing from the oil men out there in the field as well as they're being plugged. But I wanted to ask one question. When was the last lease sale? We're getting ready to do another one. No, when was the last? <laughs> I'll ask Margo right now. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember. I believe it was 20 years ago. 2018. If, if the 1906 Act says it's going to offer 25000 every quarter, why aren't you doing that? Because that's bonus money. The bonus money is what we get yeah. our funding from. That's what's our funding check. Exactly. But you're not having a lease sale. So when is your next lease sale? I think we passed. I said there'd be in late July. Late July. And then we're in our resolution, the order before. 
every quarter. So we'll have another one in September. And I think that was one of the things that Mr. Pipeston brought up is some of the things that required that they're not doing, we think we can just like plugging wells. And, and, I, and I heard the word say uh, the Minerals Council is going to have oversight like a board. Is that what the Minerals Council is going to do? No, we're not going to be a board. We're going to be a, board. Board. Be a board. Minerals Council. I don't know who said board. I don't particularly know. It was first put out on social media that the Minerals Council should be a board, a body of five. Well, I'll tell you. Here's, I'll tell you what I think, <laughs> and I'm one of y'all, you know, really, man, skeptic on a lot of this stuff. But this thing says we have to adhere to the Constitution and the 1906 Act. We cannot go around the 19. So we have a double duty. Yeah, and he did put it. Just right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's what they said. And the judge told me, you can't get it. You can't get it. You can't get it. You can't get it. Yeah, I mean, I, I get you. I understand. Yeah. Right. I know. This, I mean, I've picked this thing up many times and looked at it and tried. But I'm saying, I, I believe within my heart we can't go around all six hours. We still have, even this, when we started talking to Tara, the solicitor of the national came back and said, You can't touch the money. Don't even ask for it. All the money handling, all the payment of handwriting, all those elements. I just didn't put that up there for you. All those elements we can't touch. <laughs> they won't even hand them to us. They won't have them to us. Well, I'm, leasing is probably the crunch of all the terror. And the leasing process will be in our hands. <laughs> Right. Right. Yeah. What? Sure. So I, I missed making note of you know, a couple of estimates on what the reserves are. Can somebody? That. We're finding reserves just on the EOR, 100, 200 million barrels. Okay. Just the EOR. Okay. 100 to 200 million barrels. Is it? That's a lot more. Yeah. That's billions of dollars of revenue. Yeah. I want to know that. So then, based on what uh, he mentioned, the doer at 3,800 barrels a day. And that represents approximately half of total daily production? Yes. Okay. So we're talking 7,600 barrels a day. And the reserves are between 100 and 200 million barrels. That's just, that's just the OR that we asked the late Charles Holbert, and all our numbers are agreeing with some of the research we're doing now with experts in the field, 100 to 200 million uh, barrels. So based off the current program of, of allowing the BIA to determine how this all works, how many days of production do we have in uh, it, it's centuries, right? I mean, yeah. it's, it's centuries. Yeah. But with the Green New Deal, as you mentioned, uh, you know, the oil and gas industry the life of oil gas industry is fine. It will, it will cease to 
six at some time in the future. But yeah, I think I think our grandkids have probably gone that time. The energy the energy implementation association is saying we're going to be heavy oil up for the next 20, 50, 90% of our energy development is going to be still on the gas. I really don't, I, that's my belief of where oil companies, I'm telling you, I mean, I believe solar and geo and all those, they'll be good, but coal and some of this other stuff is still going to be a heavy hit. Because we, I work in the gas industry as well, and people are scared. They're scared of the news. They're scared. Scared? Scared. They're scared. Afraid. 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 That if you're a 30 year old guy, you're going to retire in this industry. Oh, I see. No. Well, I, I get you, but I still think that the oil and gas will be around a lot. Sure. It's going to be around a lot. Yeah. And, and, we, and we need to participate in doing energy development, all that. All that connection we have. I'm an oil and gas guy. We're going to attack those things. Yeah. We got to attack those yeah. things. That's that's yeah. why. <laughs> and we got a great team doing the plugging. We're just now wanting to start operating in some of these legacy fields that are now kind of gone down. And they're all up things. They're either up or they're married to us. All our workers in the field, that we're starting to talk sovereignty. We're starting to talk Osage is doing a lot of this. Go ahead, sorry. <laughs> well, I, I like I, I like the disgrace PowerPoint on that. I kind of agree with it. I understand. She's right. We go up there and we say, mm -hmm, it's not right. So this is what they told us, this is what they found. Well, this when I saw it one year, I thought of this whole thing. Here grab it. Not very happy. Yeah, I'm saying with the ground building, this building, all the group that's out of ground, it's so tight for one year. The whole gas. Yeah. I agree with you. We're looking at the whole lot of money. We are. What's that? Is that really great? Oh, yeah. When you're not going to walk around the street. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with you. Well, she and I have a lot of conversations going on. Yeah. 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 Well, I'm here at Dr. Not Lakes. We want to thank the Gray Horse people. My dad told me, when you do anything for the other section, you start the Gray Horse. And that's what he told me. That's the top big chief, number one on the lot. So we want to thank the Gray Horse people. I know most of the guys But we want to thank y'all for all that you do. Questions and your concern, and we're listening. We are listening. We are listening. I understand. Thank you.